and you've read that. Um, you've probably all tasted and drunk a lot of Jura wines. Some of you may be new to it. What I'm going to do today is have a look at some historical names that if you visit the region and if you uh, read about the region, you will come across quite often. I'm also going to mention the people who everybody seems to want to go and see and everybody who writes to me and says, I'm going to the Jura and I want to visit Macla, Ovenoir, Puffinet, Tiso, and I go, well, really? You know, they're not the only producers. So we're going to talk about them and why they are so famous, but who else is there? Um, so I'm also going to mention some of the basics in passing, just to remind you of how tiny this region is and how wide the amount of wines they produce is, because that means that you will get importers into the US, sometimes just bringing 24 bottles of a particular wine over into the US. And maybe these figures will help you understand why. So uh, first of all, two important historical figures to know about. Louis Pasteur, eminent scientist, was born in Dole, which is in the northern part of the Jura. Uh, Dole used to be uh, have one, have vineyards all around it. Uh, today there are no vineyards left uh, on the doorstep of Dole. You have to go further south down to saint lan les bains to find the vineyards. Um, but he actually spent most of his childhood uh, in Arbois, and that's where his family ended up living. And Arbois is the capital of the wine region. And he ended up, once he was an eminent scientist and living in Paris, he ended up bringing his family down to Arbois every summer on the train. And he would actually put on the train all his laboratory equipment so that he could continue working during the summer holidays. And he would do his experiments in the vineyards uh, and in the wineries as well, in the cellars. Uh, sometimes on the equivalent of the, in those days of Van Jeune. And in this way, he managed to prove some of his theories on bacteria and yeast and the fact that they needed uh, oxygen. And this also led to him uh, successfully concluding and proving his experiments uh, on, uh, germ hyge on hygiene and germ theory and so on. So a very, very important man who is recognized throughout the Jura by the fact that you will have Pasteur School, you'll have Pasteur Square, you'll have Pasteur Street, um, Pasteur Restaurant, uh, his name crop, crops up everywhere. Now for the wine world, the modern wine world, specifically in the Jura, um, it is Henri Maire who is very famous, although rapidly becoming forgotten. Uh, he died, um, as you'll see from here, uh, 14 years ago. Uh, he has a son and daughter who did run his wine estate uh, for many years uh, in his older life and then for a few years after he died. But today, Domaine Henri Maire is owned by the large Boisset group uh, who took it over from another financial group because there were a few problems. Going back to history, why is he important? He's important because he was a complete visionary and someone who totally believed in his family's region, uh, the Jura. He was actually mainly brought up in Paris and his parents ran a little epicerie or grocer shop. And so very at a very young age, he became very entrepreneurial. And then during the war, once France was occupied, he ended up down in the Jura and started to trade in wine. And he then built things up so much and became so ambitious that he really dragged the wine region that was in the doldrums back onto its feet. He did a, a really wonderful job. And if you speak to any of the older wine producers who are currently aged, um, say around 70, even though they perhaps would not have respected Henri Maire's wines, they always respected the person. Um, he did fantastic things. He actually uh, bought grapes uh, and bought wine that was un, uh, immature wine 
from hundreds of the grape growers there. So he became a very, very successful and important wine merchant. He created this sparkling wine brand, Vin Fou, and Vin Fou was advertised all over France. And he even used to export it to the US and other places and pull incredible stunts. Um, he really was a marvelous man. Unfortunately, the business um, did not develop. So post the 19, mid 1980s, um, things got a little bit shaky. Having said that, they own today over 200 hectares of, of vines. That's more than 10% of the region. And uh, they no longer buy grapes or act as a negociant, uh, or very rarely they buy grapes to make vin fou from outside of the Jura. So the story is, in my view, a little bit sad, but he was a, a very important man. Now, two uh, historical movements, entirely different one from another, just to put things in perspective. Firstly, on the left, you've got a picture uh, from uh, more than 100 years ago of the Frutia vinicole in Arbois. Now, Frutia is the word they use in the Jura for a wine cooperative. It comes from the cheese world. I'm sure you all know Conte comes from Jura. And in cheese production, they have fruitiers, which are milk cooperatives that in turn make cheese. Uh, it comes from the word fruit and the fruit of your labors. So uh, the fruit of many people's labors go to form a cooperative. So the Frutia Vinicole in Arbois was created because uh, this was even before Henri Maire's time. Uh, things were really in the doldrums in uh, Arbois. It was post phylloxera, post the other diseases. Um, the train had brought uh, very cheap wine from the south of France. Sales were difficult. Uh, production was difficult. Everything was difficult. And they had the government to ask uh, to answer to who were bringing in new laws on this and that and the other. So they decided to group together. They still exist today. And in fact, the Frutia Vinicole d'Arbois is one of the two biggest producers in, uh, in the Jura. And they do, do a very decent job. There are three other fruitiers, uh, one in Poupillan, which is just to the south, and two others in, in further south, nearer to Chateau Chalon, Voiteur, and Caveau de Biard. I'm going to be talking about them a little bit later. So that's one historical movement um, which involved several hundred grape growers. The other historical movement is totally different and concerns one man who's one of the, the legends of the Jura, who um, everybody asks me, how can I get to visit Pierre Auvernois, um, imagining that he is still an active wine producer. He's actually he is an active wine producer, but he's retired and he has um, passed on his uh, wine business to uh, his adopted son, who's called Emmanuel Ouillon. More about him in a while. So Pierre Auvernois, this is just a wonderful picture of him. Um, he, uh, I'm going to point him out here if I can just move the pointer, which uh, seems ooh, stuck. Let me just start again. Pointer. Yeah. Um, nope. I'm failing to move the point. Oh, here we go. Come on. There he is. Right there. That is Pierre Auvernois giving a hand to his colleagues in the in the little village of Poupillan, which is uh, these days known as the world capital of Plusar. The Plusar or Pulsar grape. Um, and there is more of this grape in the village of Poupillan than in any other village or town in the world. And you can see him here. This is in 1976. He actually began his uh, estate in his domain with a tiny inherited amount of vines in 1968, I think, from memory. Um, but he still gave everybody a hand. He's always been one of the people that helps uh, younger growers and uh, has really pushed uh, the organic movement and the natural wine movement, not only in Jura, but all over France. Uh, he decided from about 1980 to explore making wines without any additional sulfur dioxide. He was inspired by a couple of people to do that. All the story you can read about in the book. 
Um, but that's who he is, a very important and very modest and wonderful man. Um, moving on, just let's put some of this in perspective. Um, get rid of my arrow. I've talked about history. There were 10 times uh, the area of vineyards in the Jura uh, back in uh, the height of, of, of vine growing pre the diseases, pre mildew, pre phylloxera. So today you've got just over 2000 hectares or just over 5000 acres, which is the equivalent of uh, half of Shabley. And you, all you will get is 10 to 12 million bottles a year which is 0.2% of France's wine production. Now exports, which is what most of you will be concerned with because these are the wines that you'll see, these account for now 13%, um, which is a pretty dramatically high figure considering that it was only 2% uh, in about 2002, 2003 when I started um, regularly visiting the region. So 15 years ago it was 2%, now it's 13%. However, half of it is Cremont, and a lot of that Cremont comes from uh, one big negociant, um, and um, yeah, it, it comes from a lot of different producers. Uh, but this means that you can imagine how little of all the other styles of wine are actually exported. Um, let's look at how the structure of the trade works there. The negociants, um, it's a little bit complicated because Henri Maire, who I discussed earlier, is counted in the official Jura statistics as a negociant, but isn't a negociant anymore. They make wines principally from their own estate fruit. But Maison de Vigneron, which is part of the large French group that you might have come across Les Grands Chez de France. Um, I'll just write that down here in case anybody is familiar with it. Um, Grand Chez de France uh, is based in Alsace, in, um, in the Jura, and in various other places, and has a speciality of making Cremant and other traditional method sparkling wines. But in the Jura, Maison de Vigneron makes the whole gamut of Jura wines, even if Cremant is their principal production. They do a very good job of it. There's a very good um, standard quality there. Um, so they are one of the largest producers, uh, along with Henri Maire. And then there are a series of smaller producers. Uh, the best known in terms of quality is uh, Tircelline, which is also known as uh, Cave de la Reine Jeanne. This was originally founded by Stéphane Tissot and his wife, but they no longer are involved in it and uh, it is run by somebody else, but with an excellent winemaker who um, used to work for Stéphane and they do a great job and in fact they've just started buying their own vineyards as well. Uh, they do export a little bit. Um, another uh, one is called Bono, and there are several other small negociants who mainly sell within the region, uh, the greater Jura region of Franche-Comté. Then there are the four fruitiers that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about history. Arbois is by far the biggest. Um, a little note about Poupillin and uh, Voiteur, these two actually together will export under the name of Jura Vinum. Uh, so Jura Vinum is just an, a distribution company for Poupillin growers and Voiteur growers. Now Voiteur is nicknamed the Chateau Chalon Cooperative because they are based at the foot of the Chateau Chalon Hill. So they um, make a, a fair amount of Vin Jaune, Côte de Jura Vin Jaune and Chateau Chalon but they also, as everybody, make the whole range of wine. Uh, then there's Cavo de Biar, who in fact aren't very far away and are a small cooperative with very few members, um, but run in a, a very quality driven way, um, worth looking out for. And then we have individual producers who vary in size tremendously. They represent nearly half the region. So 
these are some interesting statistics from 2015. 193 wine producers, just try and imagine that. 193 people actually labeling their wine under a different name from only 2,000 hectares. Uh, many, I, I can't remember the number that export, I should have looked that one up, but it's about uh, 40 or 50 of them export to some extent, but some of those will just be to the neighboring countries, um, Belgium, Switzerland, and so on. So 39% is represented by just the four, three biggest producers, Maison de Vigneron, Fruitier d'Arbois, and Henri Maire. And then a further eight producers represent 21%. Now those eight producers, I don't actually have a list of them, but from my knowledge, I can tell you that they will include um, the other three cooperatives or fruitier. They will include Stefan Tiso, and they will include the biggest domain, which is Domaine Rolle in Arbois, and a few others. We then have 24% uh, from 35 producers. Sorry, this slide went a little crazy there. And there's a whopping great 147 producers that produce less than 3,000 or even more specifically less than 2,750 cases in the year. So it is a very, very, very fragmented situation. Um, I'm sorry the video is frozen. Well, it looks like it has. But hopefully you can all hear me okay. Are you all there? I'm just checking. Yep, good, excellent. Um, so that's the breakdown overall. I thought we'd take a little look at organics because organics are terribly important for export markets. Um, Jura does really well with the percentages. I have failed to find out, some one of you might be able to help me out here how what the percentage is currently in France of organic vineyards. I believe overall it's something like 8%, but I haven't checked that out. So for Jura to be 18% organic vineyards, certified organic vineyards, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll turn the, I'll turn the uh, video off and on, so I'll keep talking. Um, so it'll come back on in a minute. Uh, hang on a second. So 18% are certified organic, but because many of them are uh, actually small producers, it's actually one third or more of the Jura producers that are certified um, by ECOSET, which is the European standard. I'm just going to try the video again, um, but it looks very blank to me. I have no idea why. Um, time to change my computer. Anyone want to buy me a new computer? Um, hmm, sorry about that. I'll just close it one more time and start it again in a minute. So 10 of those producers are certified by Demeter or by Biodivin, um, and that means that they are certified biodynamic. I can tell you that many of the others use some biodynamic methods, and over 40 of them a part of the uh, amazing grouping that's called Le Nez dans le Vert. Le Nez dans le Vert is uh, a play on words. Those of you who read uh, French will, um, uh, will figure it out. It means the nose in the green, but the word for glass in French is vert. V-E-R-R-E, so it's also the nose in the glass. So the nose in the green, the nose in the glass is an informal grouping of organic producers who once a year run uh, a two-day tasting in the region. Uh, the Sunday is open to the public and the Monday morning is open to trade 
only trade and press only it's the most incredible tasting and now they're doing it in paris as well so it's in jura that towards the end of march and usually in paris at the end of october i think or it might be early in november can't remember that one uh, they are talking about maybe taking it to new york one day they what is wonderful about this grouping which includes um the likes of stefan tiso la Pant, um, many big names, uh, Bourdi as well, as well as small, very, very tiny producers who are organic, is that they all help each other out. And that's wonderful. If anybody has a major problem, um, injury or something like that, they will come to their aid. If, they, if somebody is being badgered by an importer who says, I need more wine and they don't have any to sell, they will most likely recommend one of the others. Um, so it, it's it's well worth looking out for if you are in the region um, to come to that fair is a great thing to do and likewise in Paris and keep your eyes open in case they do one in New York. I'm just going to run through these styles. So there we have these producers, these scores of producers, nearly all of whom grow all of the five Jura grape varieties. So just to remind you, the red grape varieties um, take up less area than the white. The most planted is Pulsar. Um, and then there's Pinot Noir, which is also used for Cremant and for Macvin, and Trousseau, uh, which is mainly just for red wines. And then in whites, the biggest planting is very much the Chardonnay, which is used for Cremant in particular, uh, but also, of course, for still white wines and for Macvan too. And then the great, uh, extraordinary Sauvignon grape. So imagine that most producers will have at least four of these um, varieties. Uh, quite a few of them don't have Pinot Noir, um, and many of them will have all five. And it's split between all these different wine styles. So that is the current volume split at the moment in recent vintages. 28% um, of Cremant, which is really high. Most of that is white, a little bit is rosé. 23% of reds with a few rosés in there. 38% um, of whites, and that means of all styles of whites, both the oxidative whites and the um, what most of us would call normal whites, um, what they call ouillé or floral whites. Vin jaune, their famous vin jaune represents only 4%. Vin de paille, the sweet wine, only 1%. And the uh, fortified Macvin is 6%. So immediately you can just break this down and try and imagine how each producer makes about between 15 and 30 different wines. There's a, one or two producers I know who produce more than 30. And you can see how the quantities are very, very tiny indeed. Now I'm going to do, uh, oh, I've lost one. Oh, where did that go? I thought I had a map coming. I don't have a map coming because I've forgotten what I'm doing. I'm going to talk to you first about the people who everybody tells me they want to go and visit. So I've mentioned Pierre Auvernois before. I'm now going to talk about Stefan. Stefan is uh, known in by anybody who knows him really as Stefan La Vie est Belle Tissot. La Vie est Belle means life is wonderful or life is beautiful. It's his catchphrase. He phones me up and he goes, wink, hello, La Vie est Belle. That's Stefan. He is a ball of energy. Anyone who's met him and he's traveled a lot in the US and all over the place to the UK as well. Anyone who's met him will will verify that. He's done an extraordinary job, um, not only for his family estate, but in my view for Jura as well. Uh, he joined very his family estate very early. It was already well established by his parents, whose name are Andre and Mireille. That's where the a and the M come from. And uh, they already had a very successful, decent sized wine estate. Um, he had decided he wanted to go organic. And his father said, and his father was only about 60 at the time, 
Andre said to him, OK, Stefan, if you want to go organic, I'm out. It's your risk. I'm not taking the risk. Back then, it was a huge risk to go organic, especially with an estate of a certain size. And Stefan said it was all or nothing. He had already developed wine styles that very few people were doing in the Jura, like doing vineyard specific Chardonnay. Uh, latterly, he's done vineyard specific Vin Jaune. Almost nobody else is doing that. He also has a whole range of sweet wines that are like Vin de Paille, but um, not within the Appellation Contrôlée. So they are showing um, in uh, the, the, the Vin de Paille will, will be under the Vin de France name if they're not done legally. I've got a little question here, which is aging in, in Amphora. Um, yes, he has experimented with age. He is and continues to make wines aged in Amphora. He's got 50 hectares, so 50 hectares across the five grapes, many different terroir, in, mainly in Arbois, but some in Côte de Jura. And he has uh, about 40 or 50 different wines every vintage. So he has been aging Sauvignon in Amphora with no added sulfur. He's also been aging Trousseau in Amphora with no added sulfur. He would not like to be called a natural wine producer, but very quietly he um, has done experiments with no sulfur and some of his wines are no sulfur. Other ones will have judicious amounts added. The main thing with Stefan is he is constantly questioning what he's doing, what's a good thing to do. Um, and he's he limits exports to a certain quantity so that he can keep the very important home market happy as well. Um, really very, very interesting character. And what I failed to say was that he then converted his uh, vineyards to biodynamics. He's also, the picture on the left actually shows you a very important vineyard slope above Arbois, uh, which is named after the tower that you can see there, which is called La Tour de Courant after which he um, names a Chardonnay. And these are young Chardonnay vines here, which uh, were when he was expanding it. Um, when he launched the Chardonnay from La Tour de Couron, which was in about 2005, but that's a guess, maybe it was later than that. Um, it was more expensive than other people's Vin Jaune. And everybody was shocked in the area that anybody could launch a Chardonnay that was more expensive than a Van Jaune. But he said, why not? You know, it's. I think it's as good as Grand Cru Burgundy, so I'm going to charge a decent price for it. And he was vindicated. Um, so he's done very well. He's not the only Tiso, And I, I really wanted to point this out because a lot. Um, it is referred to as Domaine Tiso. But there are two other sizable domains, um, and there's also somewhere else I didn't mention. So Domain Jacques Tissot uh, is the older brother of André, who is Stéphane's father. Um, Jacques is not retired, despite being um, close to 80, uh, but it is run on a day-to-day -day basis by his son uh, Philippe and his sister. Uh, they have a domain of about 30 hectares and they uh, do export and they'll be coming to the exporters tastings in New York and Chicago. Um, they run their estate in a very different way. Then there is a much smaller one, which is another relative. Jean-Louis Tissot is another brother of Jacques and André Tissot. Uh, Jean-Louis uh, retired and it is, the domain is run by, uh, I made a mistake here, it's actually Jean Christophe, the Jean hyphen Christophe, and his sister Valerie. And they run a, a small domain that uh, I think is about 15 hectares from memory, um, completely separate estate. They're another one who are just gradually launching into the export market. And um, something I'm not very uh, happy about is that um, Henri Maire, uh, who market wines under many, many different brand names, have a brand name that they use for export that is Michel Tissot. And Michel Tissot was a um, 
small negociant down near Chateau Chalon, uh, run by somebody called Michel Tissot. And uh, Henri Mayer bought it out about 20 years ago. And now they're using the name on the export market. Um, it has nothing to do with the Tissot family. So I just wanted to mention that. I'll stand on my soapbox a bit there. Um, so that's Stefan. You can see why he's famous and why everybody wants to visit him. If you do want to visit him, if you're passing through Arbois, there's the most amazing shop that he runs. He has excellent staff who run this shop. You can go there, taste the wines. You never know, Stefan might breeze in and say hello. If you are in the trade and you want to meet Stefan, if you contact them in advance, you might be able to, but he's a very, very busy man. He will accept group visits in his uh, at his winery, which is in Montigny les Arceurs, which is close just to the north of Arbois. Um, so group visits are possible if he has time. And of course, he's a wonderful host, but uh, you can't always guarantee it. He's a busy man. Now, another person who uh, constantly I am asked about, how can I go and visit this man, is Jean-Francois Ganva, also known as Fan Fan to his friends, which is a diminutive in French of Jean-Francois. I first met Jean-Francois in, I think, 2003. At that point, I had tried one of his Pinot Noirs um, in uh, the next door village to where I am in the Alps. I was very, very impressed, but he wasn't known anywhere at all, really, at the time. He uh, had taken over his father's uh, winery uh, a few years earlier. It was very, very small indeed in the southern part of Jura, which is called the Sud Revermont, which I'll show you on the map. Uh, in a while. He's in the village of Rotalier. And uh, he'd taken over his father's winery when his father fell ill. Uh, before he had tried to work with his father and it, they didn't really get on. So he'd spent 10 years in Burgundy uh, with Jean-Marc Moret. And he came back and decided to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the Jura in the same way as he was making them in uh, Burgundy. He had the great chance that his father had really looked after the vineyards and had some very, very old vines indeed. Very soon, Jean-Francois was starting to do other things. He converted to organics almost immediately. He then gradually converted to biodynamics and um, really, really worked on biodynamics in a very, very, very thoughtful way. He then, uh, a few years ago, decided that he wanted to go the no sulfur route with almost all his wines. There's one Chardonnay he makes. I can't remember the cuvee name, but it's the largest cuvee, which is um, he puts a, a judicious amount of sulfur pre-bottling, but all the rest are no sulfur. Um, his prices have gone through the roof. It's not actually just him. He has put the prices up but importers have put the prices up sky high because everything is on allocation. He has only 10 hectares or so, and from this, he makes 50 different cuvées. So you can imagine in every, um, every one is in very, very tiny quantities. Um, the allocations are not always very well organized. Um, his sister has now joined him to try and organize things. And in the meantime, he has started to source grapes from other regions as well, most particularly the Beaujolais region. And several of the wines that he makes are blends, obviously under the Vin de France uh, banner, are blends of Jura and Beaujolais. Um, so as you can imagine, this is not somebody you can just pop in and visit. Um, it is very, very difficult even for me to go and see him these days. The best way to meet him or to see him is, frankly, to go to the Le Nez dans le Verre in the end of March, the exhibition I talked about, the, the salon, um, the tasting uh, that the organic grouping has, and that's where you'll find him. What I would like to emphasize is that um, much as everybody, not everybody loves his wines, but some people love his wines, um, there are other people to visit, and he would be the first to say that. People he, who he personally has nurtured, 
people who have got um, small organic domains and estates, um, uh, many of them mentioned in my book and a few that I'll talk about soon. So look for other people. Two other people that everybody wants to visit are the legends of Vinjone and Chateau Chalon, Jacques Poufnet from Montigny les Arcieux, which is just north of Arbois, and uh, Jean Macler or Domaine Macler, uh, now run by Jean's son Laurent Macler. A few words about Jacques Poufnet. Um, Jacques Poufnet's last vintage was 2014. Uh, he sold his vineyards at that point to Domaine du Pelican, which I'm going to talk about soon. Domaine du Pelican is owned by, um, uh, is, was created by um, uh, Dangerville, by the Marquis Dangerville. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. Why is Jacques Poufnet so legendary? Well, he's a man who's now um, about 71. Uh, he uh, started making wine very young. His father didn't make wine. Uh, he put together a very small estate um, that he farmed very well. He was never organic, by the way. And he made his wines in a very simple, direct wine and a way and was simply very, very talented, particularly for red grapes, for Pulsar and for Trousseau, and particularly for Vin Jaune. And all round, uh, his range is very traditional, very sensible, and truly excellent. He's also famous in the US in particular because uh, Neil Rosenthal, the importer, brought him in uh, from the late 90s, uh, partly because uh, several restaurants, the chefs were asking um, for vin jaune and they couldn't find any vin jaune. So he sort of secreted a few bottles of vin jaune into palettes of the other wines that Jacques Poufnet made. And to his amazement somewhat, um, the wines were appreciated by initially the New York market and the rest is history. These were not the first Jura wines to go to the US. Um, Frederick Launay uh, was exporting before, so was Domaine Rollet, so was Henri Maire. Um, but they were the first wines to really make a major impact amongst the trade and the press. And then we have Domaine Macler. Well, Domaine Macler is simply a legend of Chateau Chalon. Um, some, a name that is less known in the USA and on export markets because they export very little, but is very well known within France as being far and away the finest legendary producer of Chateau Chalon. Jean Macler is a, an elderly man now and not very well. His son has worked with him for years and years and years. The picture is of his son, Laurel Mackler, who works in almost the same way as his father, apart from the fact that he has just began to do what his father did not want him to do, which is to start making a few limited quantity white wines that are shock horror, topped up, not oxidative, made in the Ouillé style. The Vin Jaune, or Chateau Chalon, as it should be correctly called, uh, is amazing, completely amazing. So what do you do about visits to these guys? Well, Jacques Poufnet will accept visitor, visitors still, but he has a very few wines to sell. Um, but your friend should better be good. Um, he won't be able to speak any English. Um, he's a very recalcitrant man. You have to get to know him. Uh, it took me years to really um, get anywhere with him. Once you know him, he's wonderful, um, but difficult to visit, as you can imagine. Domaine Macler is a different situation. They have a tasting room, um, but you have to make an appointment there. And um, usually the phone will be answered either by um, Madame Macler Senior or Madame Macler Junior. Um, Madame Macler Senior is Jean's wife. And Madame Macler Jr. is Laurent's sister. They are both tough women. Um, 
very, very, very difficult to get an appointment to visit unless you specifically say you're there to buy wines. If you do get to go and visit, uh, you will be given a taste of their white wine. You'll be given a taste of the current vintage of Chateau Chalon, and you will always be given a visit, a, vi a taste of an older vintage of Chateau Chalon, sometimes 10, 15 years older than the current vintage. It's a wonderful experience, but again, really you need to be with somebody who speaks French um, and it's not a normal, regular visit at all. So these are all the people who are difficult and everybody asks me about. So I'm going to rapidly move on and let's talk about some of the bigger and more open, more, uh, but sometimes less known visitors. We're going to go from north to south. So we're going to start in uh, the Arbois area, which is the most densely planted area of the Jura, with the village that is not marked on here of montigny les arcieux which is about there, which is the most famous area for Trousseau, and uh, Poupillin, which I mentioned earlier, which is the most famous uh, area for Pulsar. Uh, when I, I, some of you may know that I'm actually going to be running um, a four day visit for Wine Scholar Guild. And we're actually going to be starting in Besançon, which is up there. We're then going to be staying three nights in a pretty amazing hotel, which is near Moucha. And so, what we'll do on the first day is we'll just visit in this area. On the second day, uh, we will do this center part. So this center part is uh, Côte de Jura, but in particular, you have the traditional areas of Chateau Chalon, Arles over here, and the L'Etoile Appellation. Um, and then uh, on another day, I've forgotten which way around this is, we'll go to the Sud Reverbon, which is where Ganva is. No, we won't be visiting Ganva, sorry there are others to visit um, and then we can also pick up a few producers who are in this Côte de Jura area near Poligny. So quickly I'm going to go north to south with some good names to know. Leading lights of Montigny les Arcieux, who everybody forgets about, Domaine Dugois, absolutely brilliant estate started by Daniel Dugois and his wife Monique they are a small estate that have um, the four grapes, no Pinot Noir, but they have a significant amount of Trousseau because they're in Montigny les Arcieux. They even make a Cremant rosé from Trousseau and several different cuvées of Trousseau. Uh, that's fabulous. So is their Chardonnay and so is their Vin Jaune. It's run today by Philippe, who speaks excellent English, um, and uh, as does his wife. Uh, if you go and visit, but you'll also see Philippe if you go to the export trade tastings. Then there is a very contrasting guy, uh, Frederick Lornay, on the right. Wonderful character. He does export a little to the USA, but he doesn't participate in the export trade tastings. So look out for his wines. Wonderful Chardonnay, Trousseau and Vin Jaune, and a fabulous Sauvignon Houillet as well. Um, he is someone you can visit. He speaks English. You just have to, you can even just turn up at the cellar. But if you want to see him, just make a quick appointment. There are other estates that are important um, in Montigny, uh, lots of them, but ones I wanted to pinpoint, trying to move my arrow here. Uh, I'll give up on that. So, um, Cavo de Bacchus, Lucien Avier, and his son Vincent Avier. Great characters, old school, no English spoken, but worth a visit. Michel Gaillet is very much on the natural side. Um, he makes uh, some no sulfur wines farmed organically. Very interesting Trousseau again and interesting white wines too. And Jean-Louis Tissot, I mentioned earlier, run by Valerie and her brother Jean-Christophe, who you might see in New York or Chicago if you go to the export tastings. Uh, staying in Arbois, just a few really important people to know. Um, Pascal and Evelyn Claret, natural wine producers who are the, what I call really 
thinking natural rhyme producers. They are really careful about what they've done. I've actually done a day of harvest with them. Their winery is immaculate, everything's immaculate. They work biodynamically, even though they're not Demeter certified. Um, and they also have a fabulous little bistro in the summer in Arbois. It's only open from mid-June to the end of August, but go there if you're in Arbois. Below them on the bottom left is a lovely guy, Patrice Hughes-Begue, uh, married to an English uh, lady called Caroline. Uh, Caroline, I should say. She, her name is Caroline Hughes. He is Patrice Begue. Um, and he is an up and coming star also of the natural world. They're the small guys. On the right hand side, you've got the big guys. Jacques Tissot, what a character he is. Larger than life, difficult man. And his uh, shyer son, Philippe, who you might meet in New York. Um, they make the whole range of wines. I particularly like. Um, their, one of their Chardonnays and a Sauvignon Huillet. And then below you have one of the um, brothers and sisters. Uh, Eliane runs Domaine Rollet with her brothers, three brothers. Um, they're all of a certain age and they've actually been trying to sell this domain for many, many years, but they can't find the right buyers and they haven't got any children willing to take it over. It's a substantial domain if anybody wants to pick up a little deal there any takers it's a mere 70 hectares they want to sell it in one go and they have a great big winery they specialize these days in magnums uh, they have a great shop in the middle of arbois as does um, jacques tiso above by the way if you're just passing through for a day you can pop into any of these shops uh, in summer open on sunday as well and uh, taste through the ranges. So Rollet, Jacques Tissot, big guys with big ranges. Um, moving on, biodynamic estates in Arbois. We're going to be visiting at least one of these on the trip uh, that we're running in October. Uh, but I can't uh, tell you which one yet because uh, it's too early to make appointments for October. On the left, you see uh, Francois Duvivier, who for 10 years uh, has was the regisseur or the manager and winemaker for Guillaume the Marquis d'Angerville in Volnay. The two of them jointly own uh, the estate that they created in Arbois from scratch, Domaine du Pelican. Um, initially, they got hold of 10 hectares five hectares um, that was run extremely well in along biodynamic uh, lines, but the person wanted to retire, Chateau de Chavan, and five hectares that were run along loosely organic lines, but had been left to rack and ruin and nobody bothered to prune or treat. And so they had to actually um, pull up most of the vines and start again. But they knew what they were doing. They're on the best sites in Arbois and they had never seen chemicals. And then uh, three years after they started the estate, they took over Jacques Pufnay's vineyards. They wanted them at the beginning. This is a secret between all of us. I can tell you, I knew about them wanting to buy Jacques Pufnay years ago, but Jacques wouldn't sell. He wouldn't sell and he wouldn't sell and he wouldn't sell. And eventually, when he really did need to stop working and retire, he sold the vineyards to them um, because he got the best deal from them. And not everybody in the wine region was happy. There's been um, a lot of polemic about this. Um, I actually think that Marquis d'Angerville does a great job in that they uh, run their vineyards immaculately in biodynamic way. And so they're busy converting Jacques Pouffenet's vineyards at the moment. So they have two ranges. Uh, I haven't had a chance to taste the younger wines yet because I haven't been in the region much recently. Um, but they're doing a good job. Uh, in Jura, people are a little jealous. They say we don't want Burgundians necessarily in Jura, but that's typical um, small region jealousies. Very different. On the right, Domaine de la Pinte is one of the larger estates in Jura, over 30 hectares all of it run along organic lines for many years and uh, converted to biodynamic uh, a few years ago and 
really beautifully managed. They have a large amount of um, Sauvignon proportionately. And so they make various different types of Sauvignon wines, um, not just Vin Jaune, but topped up Sauvignon that has been uh, aged for several years in oak, but judiciously topped up. Intriguing wines. Many people like their Pulsar as well. They do two different Pulsards that are, they are partly in Arbois and partly in Arbois Poupillon, because Arbois Poupillon is a sub appellation of Arbois. Um, lovely place. Um, you can visit them. They have a very um, rather old fashioned tasting room. Uh, but if you get to see the barrel cellars, they're well worth visiting. And the great thing is that even though they have this old fashioned tasting room, you can go and visit without appointment. There's always someone there to give you a tasting. Um, the manager has changed hands in the last year. It's owned by um, a big company, but who lets the manager do their own thing. It's not a wine company that owns it, but a road building company who uh, have done a wonderful job with Domaine de la Pente. Moving slightly up the hill, to Poupillon. I've already talked about um, Pierre Auvenois, who you will see pictured on the left there. Um, there he is with his um, adopted, uh, ooh, I've just done, I've just got to click on something here uh, because I've lost my chat box. Don't worry, we need oh. um, <laughs> uh, Could I, Julien, could you just tell me how I've just ended up? <laughs> I've just ended up with my uh, oh. with the image uh, of yes. the if presentation in front of me and nothing uh, else on my screen. Uh, Any ideas what I can click? No. Well, you made it big for everybody. Um, oh, I've I've found. I think I've. Yes. There's a drop down. Is it? Ah, oh. I've got it. Full screen. I've done it. It's all right. Sorry for the interruption, folks. Technical rubbish. So Pierre Auvenoir and his uh, successor. He never had any children, but effectively Manu, as he's called, Emmanuel Ouillon, is his adopted son. He in turn is married and has children that are today Pierre's adopted grandchildren. Manu is a wonderful guy. He's taken on what he's learnt from Pierre, but he brings in his own ideas as well. He is converting the estate to biodynamics. He works completely with no added sulphur and uh, follows on what the master has done. But there are several other players in Poupillon who are important. Many of you might have heard of the exuberant Philippe Bonnard on the right. Um, he was a sort of disciple of um, Pierre Auvenoir. He actually started life off with his vineyards in the Poupillon Cooperative or Fruitière. And Pierre just um, encouraged him and helped him to go his own way. Um, he also makes natural wines. Um, I said he loves posing for photographs. He actually was on a reality TV show, uh, The Farmer is Looking for a Mate on French TV. That was quite funny. Um, he actually had a mate already because he um, but uh, so it was all a, a bit of a sham. But he's a wonderful character, a very genuine guy, fun to visit, very old fashioned sellers. Then there are other people who are less talked about, but should be more talked about. Jean-Michel Petit from Domaine de la Renardière. His estate is over 25 years old. He's always worked in a sustainable way, but recently converted to organics. I just love his range of wines, not only Plusar, but some lovely fine white wines as well. And Domaine de la Borde, a younger Domaine, but now, ooh, a good 10 years, no, 12 years old now. Julien Maréchal started when he was only 24 um, and again, more recently has converted to organics and is doing a great job of it. Um, both of them are great to visit, but these are small domains. Uh, they have to have um, appointments. It's the only way. Now I'm going to move further south to real unknowns in the Polony area, particularly this character on the left, Christian Pescher, 
I've only recently discovered that Neil Rosenthal has started taking on Christian's wine. So you're going to see them in the US now, little by little, very traditional domain. He does a great job. And on the right is Benoit Bados. Benoit um, comes from a long, long line of producers. And uh, his father was the person who started the festival, the um, Percé du Vin Jaune. And um, son has had a hard act to follow, but he's someone who, by the way, speaks very good English if you want to arrange a visit. Uh, he also exports. They do a very sound range of wines indeed. I'm sort of waiting for him to go organic. I think he will eventually, but he hasn't quite. Others that are up and coming uh, and of a size, uh, a decent size, a Domaine Grand. They've been round for many years, but there was a split in the family. So they've actually gone from being uh, a domain of about 25 hectares back down to about 10 hectares um, because it's just run by one young couple. Um, and I think they're going to do great things in the future. And Domain Bode is a long um, established family domain of a reasonable size with holdings in Chateau Chalon as well as in Côte de Jura, uh, as does Domaine Grand, by the way, they have Chateau Chalon too. And Domaine Bode are also now run by the latest generation, a brother and sister who I think are well worth looking out for and uh, will do better and better things in future. Moving on south to Arles. Uh, these are two historic producers. Chateau d'Arlay is run by Alain, the Count, Comte de la Guiche, from a very aristocratic family. He has a very difficult job because he has to keep this stately home um, going, which is very expensive. Um, it is a, a site that you can just visit as a tourist and uh, taste some of their wines while you're there. Um, they've had a few problems with the vineyards because they couldn't, didn't have any money to invest in them and the cellars. But things are getting better and I think the wines here will get better and better again and regain their glory of old. They're famous for their Vin Jaune, which they always sell several different vintages at the same time. Also their Sweet Vin de Pie and their Mac Vin. Um, that, but it is believed to be the original home for Pinot Noir. Uh, way back in the 14th century. There haven't been vineyards for the whole of that time, but it was Alain's uh, father, I believe, uh, who uh, restart, sort of restarted the vineyards, replanted them on the hill in the village of Arles. And then there is uh, Carve Jean Bourdi, which is better known in the US because um, Jean-Francois on the right the two brothers um, loves traveling around the USA and opening very old bottles. Um, they used to be negociants uh, as well as growers. So many of the old bottles were sort of bought in years back, but they have stored wines in, in an extraordinary way for many, many years. They insist on very, very um, traditional winemaking methods. They make a blend of blended white a blended red and Vin Jaune, Vin de Pie and Mac Vin. And so a very interesting ancient cellar to visit. Um, interesting and different sort of place. Over to Chateau Chalon, I've mentioned Domain Macler, but this is the other great uh, uh, domain of the area, Domain Berthe Bondé, recently converted to organics and now uh, gradually Jean Berthe Bondé's uh, daughter Hélène is taking over having done a course specifically in organic uh, vine growing and winemaking, uh, somewhere lovely to visit, um, make an appointment, although they have a tasting room that's open at certain times. And it's certainly somewhere that I expect will be going with the group in October. And the Appellation of L'Etoile. L'Etoile means star. And if there is a single shining star, it's Nicole Derriot of Domaine de Montbergeau, who makes wonderful white wines. Um, it's a Chardonnay dominated uh, um, appellation. She makes sh Chardonnays that are not topped up, but don't also always get the veil. 
beautifully made um, and likewise the vin jaune that she makes van der pie and a really drinkable cremant uh, lovely lady as well somewhere also that one can visit fairly easily and lens le saunier which is the capital town of the of the department of jura doesn't have any wineries sort of within the city boundaries uh, outside just for reference on the left you'll see this vin jaune cellar which uh, actually houses um, several hundred barrels in a temperature controlled area um, this is the huge Maison de Vigneron, 6,000 barrels they can store there. This was opened in about 2013, I think. Um, and then on the right, a complete contrast. This is one of the under-the-radar under wonderful um, biodynamic producers, Domaine Pignet. They've been biodynamic for more than 15 years. It's run by Antoine, Jean-Étienne and Florence, brothers and sisters and uh they these days are <laughs> i can see this question no fred i have no idea where you can find any of these wines in san diego check winesearcher.com um the uh range includes some extraordinary blends under van de france uh label which are from rare grape varieties not the main five and they do lovely vin jaune, lovely white wine, lovely, beautiful Chardonnay, actually, both an oxidative style and a topped up non oxidative style. Really splendid domain uh, with a great tasting room run by Florence that you can go and visit. And Florence and Jean Etienne speak uh, reasonable English. Um, finally, the area of Sud Revermont, which is where Jean Francois Ganva is based in Rotalier. In the same village, you have the Labbe family, uh, one of the lovely families of the area. I've known them for many, many years. Uh, their parents, Alain and Josie, uh, started the domain. Um, they were organic once, then they weren't, and now they're going back towards organics. They make beautiful white wines and very light red wines. Great Van Joan too. And then more newcomers, uh, Peggy Boronfoss with her husband. Um, she started the domain uh, in a from tiny, a tiny base. And then her husband was able to leave his teaching job, Jean Pascal, and join her. They are in the same hamlet as, um, de, as um, Jean-Francois Ganva, and he helped them start off and did a great job. Over here we have a picture of Valerie Klosse, who is from Belgium, and she runs a biodynamic estate with her husband, uh, doing stunning sparkling wines, uh, Pinot Noir, if you can get hold of it, and Chardonnay. They don't; uh, their their domain is mainly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And another notable uh, estate to look out for is Marne Blanche. All of these are organic. Um, so it's interesting that uh, the Sud Revermont has a lot of organic producers. I've talked an awful lot. Um, I haven't given you many times for cre uh, many much time for questions. Um, just to give you these dates, if anybody wants to make a note of them, um, Le Nez dans le Vert is this year being held near Arbois in Domaine de la Pinte, um, 26th of March for consumers and trade, of course. And Monday, the 27th of March, morning only for trade and press. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful lunch for trade and press afterwards when everybody has a very jolly time with the vignerons. And then there are the export tastings this coming month in the first week of April. I shall be there. I'm very excited to be there. So um, any of you going to be able to come? Chicago. Um, there is going to be an evening event for consumers and I have a different email address that I'm going to give you that Alison would prefer you used. It didn't exist when I created this PowerPoint a week ago, but if you would like to go, the places at the seminar are very limited indeed, so you can't be guaranteed a place, but uh, trade and press are welcome to write for an invitation to trade at jura-wine.com 
uh, for either of these events. And there's supposed to be a consumer evening, which will be payable. Um, so you can email that address if you want to know the details of that or follow Jura Wine on Facebook, which is my personal uh, pay. Well, I have a personal page and I also have Jura Wine, which you can have a look at for things like this, which I'll be mentioning. And of course, in October, there's the study tour. Please look on the website, on the Wine Scholar Guild website for details of that. Um, and do get in touch with any specific uh, questions. I'm sure Julianne would pass them on to me if you do have specific questions. Um, the book that I wrote, uh, all the photographs in this uh, presentation came from the book and were taken by Mick Rock um, of CFAS.com. So a thank you to him. Um, please don't steal photographs for blogs. Make sure you contact him. It's a much better way round to do it. Copyright's important. I have a book that's still for sale. It's more or less still up to date, even though I published it in 2014. Um, yes, there have been some changes with people like Jacques Pufnet and a few restaurants and this and that. But I would say 90, more than 90 percent, probably 95 percent. In fact, yes, 95 percent is still up to date. Um, you can buy it from me. You can get a discount through Wine Scholar Guild, um, which was on your email. And if you are coming to New York or Chicago for those tastings, if you already have a book, bring it along and I'll sign it. I'd be happy to do that. And if you uh, haven't got a book, you can buy one from me directly there. Um, limited stocks I'm taking there, but there'll be some. Any questions? I've talked a lot. Anybody still there? Hello, Keith Edwards. Um, name I recognize. Um, hey, somebody's typing, so I'm waiting for that.